welcome to worship at St. John on this first Sunday in the season of Lent as we are in our 40-day journey with each other and with Jesus to Jerusalem and the cross. Another beautiful morning this morning, looking forward to some warmer weather over the next few days, a foretaste of what is to come, but we're not there yet. It's a bit like Lent. We know what is coming, but we're not there yet. You got to go through the rest of winter, right? Because something else will show up. Uh, as we gather this morning, uh, we keep in mind, I invite us to keep in mind uh, our uh, Lenten study. Uh, we'll be reading through Paul's letter to the Colossians, and we're kind of using that as a framework to look at these texts today. Paul is writing to that community, inviting them to consider who God is, kind of encouraging them in their understanding of who God is, and what that then means for how we live our lives, both in relationship to God, but also to each other. It is good that we are gathered together this morning. I invite us to stand as we begin with our confession and forgiveness. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Beloved, hear the good news. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us when we were dead in sin, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. And we sing.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Holy God, Heavenly Father, in the waters of the flood you saved the chosen, and in the wilderness of temptation you protected your Son from sin. Renew us in the gift of baptism. May your holy angels have charge of us that the wicked foe may have no power over us. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. I invite you to be seated. We'll continue with the reading. The first reading comes from Genesis, the ninth chapter. Today's reading is the conclusion to the flood story. Because of human sin, God destroys the earth by flood, saving only Noah, his family, and the animals on the ark. Yet divine deconstruction, destruction gives way to divine commitment. As in the first creation, God blesses humanity and establishes a covenant with all creatures. God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds and shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Word of God, word of life. Our psalm is Psalm 25, which we will read responsibly. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. My God, I put my trust in you. Let me not be put shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. Let none who look to you be put to shame. Rather, let those be put to shame who are treacherous. Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation, and you have I trusted all the day long. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and love, for they are everlasting. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Remember me according to your steadfast love, and for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. You lead the lowly in justice and teach the lowly your way. All your paths, O Lord, are set as love and faithfulness to those who keep your covenant and your testimonies. The second reading comes from the first chapter of Peter, the third chapter. As God acted through Christ's suffering and death to bring us to God, so God acts through baptism to save us from a sinful existence existence. This spiritual cleansing marks our new life in Christ. Christ also suffered for our sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey. When God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water, and baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, 
not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good concise, conscience. <clears throat> Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. I invite us to stand as we sing our greetings to the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The Gospel of the Lord. All right, a little bit of background, going back to our text from Genesis. What's that bow that God is talking about? What is it? It's the rainbow. And here's how it works. Any of my younger folks do the archery thing? That's been one of the sports I know a lot of our folks have taken care of. How does the bow go? Like this or like this? goes like this, right? If that's the staff part of the bow, which way is the bow pointing? It's pointing up. God is not shooting God's arrows. Think now, right? Greek mythology, right? God is not shooting God's arrows down on earth to afflict it. God has turned God's bow and away from earth. That's part of the promise that you see, right? The bow is pointed in a safe direction. Any of you have taken, right, gun safety for hunting and all of that, you keep your gun pointed away from people, right? Point it up. That's what they're talking about with the bow. And every time you see that bow, that is a sign of God's promise. No peace to it. Now, tucking that little tidbit away in your brains. We're reading Paul's letter to the Colossians for our Lenten study this year, and as I said, there are kind of two main things that Paul is trying to do in that letter. First, to describe who Jesus and therefore who God is, and what sets this God that we follow apart from all the other little g gods that humans devote themselves to. And then the second thing is what that understanding of who God is means for those of us who follow this God through Jesus, what sets us apart from those who follow those little g gods. And that can be a helpful lens, I think, to look at our texts for today. In our text from Genesis, we come at the end of the story of Noah and the ark, the God who created all that exists has called it good, has called this capstone of God's creation, human beings, very good. God has just done a hard reboot of the world after it was corrupted seemingly beyond repair. God preserved Noah and his family who have continued, Scripture says, to be in right relationship with God. And God has also kept, in essence, the source code 
of all the created world, right? All the animals in the ark wipe the rest out in the flood, a blotting out of a corrupted system. Now, there are several things that we learn about God in this story. First, God is willing to adapt God's relationship with creation. God was convinced the flood was the way to move forward with creation. But in this covenant, God promises not just to Noah and his family, not just to humans, but did you catch it, to all of creation, God says, I will never again deal with the world this way. God adapts God's relationship with creation. Second, we learn that God is willing to bind God's self to humans and to creation in a covenant. Now, a covenant is a legally binding relationship of promises and responsibilities. This was a form that was known to the early Israelites. It's one that they used among themselves. It's a kind of agreement between normally someone who was in a superior position and those who are in inferior position. A king, would there would be a covenant between a king and the king's people. The king says, I will do these things. Here is what you do in return. God is willing to to enter into that kind of agreement. And finally, from this moment on, we learn that God will never again give up on all of creation. Instead, God has found something redeeming in everyone. Something worth pursuing, not destroying. The God who created all that exists has bound God's self in relationship to us and to all of creation. It's a relationship that comes out of these floodwaters. God limits God's own powers for the sake of humans and all of creation. The psalmist talks about God's ways and paths, the character of God. God's ways are compassion, steadfast love, faithfulness, gracious and just. All of this in contrast to the ways in which we humans often treat each other. Now the steadfast love of God in the Hebrew is called chesed. It's a rich word which Bible scholar Daryl Bach says wraps up in itself all the positive attributes of God. Love, covenant, faithfulness, mercy, kindness, loyalty. In short, he says, chesed are acts of devotion and loving kindness that go beyond the requirements of duty. God's word to us is sure. God's love for us is unwavering. God sticks with God's promises even beyond our own walking away from it. This is who the God we follow is. God is chesed. And in this way, God is unlike any of those little g-gods humans turn to. And here I mean gods in the way that Martin Luther defined it in his small catechism. He says, gods are the things we fear, love, and trust the most. The things we devote our lives to, that we believe will save us, will give us life fuller and more abundant. And too often, when these little g-gods we follow bear human faces, they're leaders, they're celebrities, influencers who do not display chesed, who are not faithful to those who follow them, who seek only fame and fortune and power for themselves. Or the gods we devote ourselves to are things or ideas, power, influence, money, getting more stuff, getting more experiences. The God we follow is the one the author of 1 Peter reminds us who sent God's own Son into the world. Beloved, come to tell us, after so many failures, 
about the way to the reign of God. Here, let me show you, God seems to be saying. This way to the reign of God is the way out of the reign of the world. That reign of the world can be all right for a time or for a few people. But every time we trust in that, it seems to lead us again and again back to war and disease and distrust. The good time of the reign of this world cannot last. The God we follow, the God who has claimed us as beloved in the waters of baptism is a God of steadfast love and faithfulness to us, who goes above and beyond to bring justice, peace, grace to all of creation, not just us, not just our kind, not just those with the same political views we have or account balance we have or background we had. God is chesed, God is steadfast love and faithfulness for all that God has created. And yet, it is only within the bounds of this covenant with God, walking with God in God's ways and paths, following along behind Jesus, it's only there that we can fully experience this reign of God. So what then does it mean for us to follow this God that we worship, that we've just talked about? Well, it means that in our relationship with God, we strive to be faithful in the same way that God is faithful. Now, it doesn't mean that there will be no arguments, trials, tribulations, right? Just look at the scriptures. Humans have been talking back to God from the beginning. Abraham argues with God over the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah. The Psalms are chock full of those who ask where God is in the midst of their suffering. Job argues his case against God about his own suffering. So it's okay. God can handle that kind of conversation. But in each of those Psalms, even in Psalm 22, which Jesus quotes on the cross, right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In each of those psalms that ask God, where are you and what are you doing? For all of their calling God to account, every one of them turns back to trust in God. Trust in the God that they know from experience is trustworthy. Trust in the God they know through their parents and grandparents Trust in the God they know through the faithful witness of Scripture. And this is a God who is steadfastly loyal, who can be counted on. And so we trust that. We rest in that, ultimately. That this is the character of the God we worship also means that this is how we live in relationship to one another, showing each other love, and mercy, grace, covenant loyalty. That we stick with one another even when they seem to turn from us. And that we see in others the same value and worth that God sees in us. And so we do not give up on them, but we pursue their good. Yet this has not always been the way that the church writ large or even the church writ small has lived. I get continually frustrated when I hear people on social media or from my students in my class at the University of Dubuque or even just talking to folks on the street about how Christians believe you have to be perfect to be one of them or they say ah they're all about hating people and hating things and I just want to shout no 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 we are not all defined by the things and people we reject no, there is not anyone who is outside of God's care and love. The covenant of Genesis that is, uh, God has made in Genesis 
is a covenant with all of creation. Too often this is us as church at our worst. And I think it is often when the siren call of those other little g-gods blocks out our ability to hear God and we turn to the things of this world. And I'm also frustrated because, doggone it, I do it too. It can be hard to navigate this. Because sometimes it's not that simple. We live in this tension between what is and what should be, between, well, there are some realities of living in the reign of this world and what it ought to be in the reign of God. I am so proud and excited that we have raised $190,000 over the last four months to pay down uh, our mortgage before our refinance. That refinance is coming up. We hope to have some really good news to pass along to you soon. We'll let you know. I'm excited about that. I'm proud of that. But I'm also torn by it, I have to say, because of the amount of time and attention we've had to focus on that. Rather than attending to trying to discern, okay, who has God called us to be and what ministry has God called us to do here in Ely other than just being the only church in town? But you got to have a place to be. You got to pay the bills, right? It's hard navigating this. But this is one of the gifts of Lent, I think. It's a bit like those 40-day challenges that were so popular a couple of years ago. You see those on social media, right? 40 days of push-ups, 40 days of, of uh, sit-ups or leg lifts or whatever it was, right? To transform your body. These 40 days of Lent provides us a limited time frame that we can really focus on this area of our lives. It seems to be a kind of manageable amount of time to consider, to ponder. That God in baptism has claimed you, called you beloved, marked you with the sign of the cross, gifted you through the Holy Spirit with abilities and skills in a unique combination, something that is just yours. And to ask questions, understanding that are you living life in relationship with others with the same grace, love, and mercy that God has shown you? Are you keeping your Eighth Commandment attitude and looking at what others do in the best possible way? And if not, why not? What are the things that hold you back? And how can you pray to God and ask for help in changing? God in baptism has claimed you, called you beloved. And so it's worth pondering. Are you living your life in relationship to God with the same steadfast love and faithfulness that God has for you? Or are you in effect stepping out on God? sharing your devotion with someone or something else? And if so, why are you doing that? What do you think it gains you? And how can you pray to God with the same boldness and truthfulness of the father of the epileptic boy when he cries out to Jesus, I believe, help my unbelief. I think that's the best prayer I've ever heard. I believe, help my unbelief. God in baptism has claimed us corporately. This is the y'all gang. Has called us to be an outpost of God's reign on earth. A visible sign of what Jesus says in our gospel is coming near. And so we ask the question, are we living up to that calling as a community? Where do we fall short? 
how might we so live our lives together that we better embody what God has called and equipped us to do and to be on the corner of Walker and Rowley? It's a lot of questions and a lot of soul searching. But what better time to do it than during this journey with Jesus to the cross during Lent? To see once again this story that is laid out for us in our readings today of a God who continually reaches out to be in relationship with us, to call us to a way of life that will bring life fuller and more abundant for everyone. A life that seeks to heal others, to feed others, to make sure they too have that full and abundant life. And of a God who loves us in all our imperfections and messiness, loves us enough to send God's own Son so that we might listen to him. Who in baptism loves us from death back into life. And so I invite us to take these 40 days and exercise our spiritual muscles. Let's spend time together reading scripture, particularly Paul's letter to the Colossians. Let's spend time in prayer asking for God's strength in those places where we are weak, for God's guidance in those places where we are lost. And let's spend time in fellowship especially table fellowship. There's something about sitting down over a cup of coffee or a hot bowl of soup. And just being the body of Christ together, practicing being this outpost of the reign of God that we are called to be. And we do these things so that at the end of these 40 days, we might have a clear sense of who God is and what God means in our lives. So that we might better be that outpost of the reign of God on the corner of Walker and Rally, And that we might fully experience the joy of loving God with all that we are. And loving our neighbors as ourselves. And for that I say, thanks be to God. Invite us to stand as we sing our hymn of the day.
Let us confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things, let us pray for the church, creation, and all those who are in need. God, our truth, the ark of your church has room for many expressions of faith. We give thanks for voices that challenge and awaken your people. Give us ears to hear those voices and wisdom to discern how you are calling us through them. Hear us, O oh God. God, our maker, we remember your covenant with the earth and its inhabitants. Rescue communities and creatures hurting from wild disasters, from natural disasters, especially California, from recent flooding in Chile, from wildfires. Bring sufficient rain and good weather to prepare the earth for crops and inspire us to be good stewards of this earth and all its creatures. Hear us, O God. God, our light, you know our weakness. Free all who govern from the temptations of power. Sustain all who work for human rights and dignity in every nation. Grant citizens of nations wisdom in choosing their leaders, that there might be peace in your world. Hear us, O oh God. God, our help, you care for your beloved children. Comfort all who are grieving, ill, afraid, in pain, or in despair. Feed hungry people. Protect any at risk from exploitation and abuse. And equip caregivers with a portion of your mercy, grace, and love. Hear us, O oh God. God, our home, you gather your people. Grant us health and safety as we assemble. Keep us mindful of any who are homebound, hospitalized, or recovering. Especially, we pray this day for Sally, Cooper, Linda, Nancy, Mike, Patty, Shunji, Bill, Roger, Cindy, Stephanie, Mark, Marius, Pearl. Catherine, George, Donna, Shayla, Tom, Paul, Lane, Katie, Sam, Marilyn, Robert, Crimson, Tim, Dick, Joyce, Karen, Rachel, Morris, and all those whom we name now aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Hear us, O God. God, our hope, guide and support us as we strive to follow in your paths. Inspire us to greater devotion to that journey during this season of Lent, not for your sake, but for ours. Hear us, O oh God. God, our life, you promised eternal life to your beloved children. We remember with gratitude those who have lived and died in the faith, and especially we remember the family and friends of Ida Mae Harford on her death. Grant them peace and hope in the promised resurrection. Hear us, O oh God. Accompany us on our journey, God of grace, and receive the prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Amen. Let us share that peace with one another, but first we need to Share peace with those who are watching. All right, now you can peace each other.
as you are done peacing, I invite you to be seated. Okay, here's one of those spoken of moments of tension. Uh, if you have uh, uh, an offering to make to the mission and ministry of St. John, uh, you can do so as you uh, leave through the center of doors. Please just leave that offering in the gold plates there. You can also always make an offering online. As we have journeyed over the last half year or so, we have taken this opportunity to name places that we have seen God at work in the world. Where have you seen God at work in this past week? Thanks be to God. And that took, a, that took a community to get there. Both his work, but also yours and caregivers and others to get to that place. Yeah, thanks be to God. Are there places that you have seen God at work this week? Yeah. Moments that build up uh, and that empower uh, others. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, Paul talks about uh, often in his text that you know, love builds up. Uh, and if God is love, that is God's desire. Yeah. And also, I mean, the gifts that have been given to her uh, that she is making use of. Her gifts uh, and her opportunities and the way she is using them have certainly aligned. Plus, you know, go Hawks. <laughs> God does not have a special favor for the Hawkeyes. But in all of these things and other places, uh, we see God already at work in the world and also understand God can be and is at work in and through us. And this is part of what we ponder in this thing. To see those places in us and to see how better we can work together to align ourselves to God's ways and God's paths. And now, as we prepare to receive this offering of Christ's own body and blood for us, I invite us to stand and sing this hymn of praising God for who God is. Let us pray. Jesus, you are the bread of life and the host of this meal. Bless these gifts that we have gathered that all people may know your goodness. Feed us not only with this holy food, but with hunger for justice and peace. We pray this in your name. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast that renewed in the gift of baptism we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
Holy God, our living water and our merciful guide, together with rivers and seas, wells and springs, we bless and magnify you. You led your people Israel through the desert and provided them water from the rock. We praise you for Christ, our rock and our water, who joined us in our desert, pouring out his life for the world. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his life, death, and resurrection, we await your salvation for all this thirsty world. Pour out your spirit on this holy food and on all the baptized gathered for this feast. Wash away our sin that we may be revived for our journey by the love of Christ. Through him all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom. Teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come receive bread for the journey, a feast for hungry hearts. Come. I invite you to be seated. I'll invite my communion assistants forward. Uh, communion will be uh, as normal. We'll start at the back at the uh, dismissal of the ushers. You'll come down the front. You are to receive body of Christ given for you and you'll eat. You'll step to the side. Red is wine. White is grape juice. Blood of Christ shed for you and you'll drink. As you go back by the side aisles, please help us do the dishes and put your cups into the white baskets. There is gluten-free available for anyone who needs. Just let me know when you come forward. All are welcome at the table. Come.
Let us pray. Generous God, at this table we have tasted your immeasurable grace. As grains of wheat are gathered into one bread, now make us one loaf to feed the world. In the name of Jesus, the bread of life, amen. And speaking of this meal, I don't know about you, but that was an appropriate uh, blood of Christ for Lent, wasn't it? That was dry. <laughs> That's multi-sensory worship for you. A uh, couple of announcements. Um, coming up this Wednesday, uh, soup supper at 6 o'clock p.m. I think the soups are pretty well filled out. It looks like maybe we need some sandwiches if you would be able to help by providing that. We do ask that if you bring a soup or bring sandwich that you please help with um, uh, serving that, uh, serving the soup, at least the initial go around, and uh, help with cleanup that uh, helps everybody get in for our worship at 7 o'clock. Um, and our focus, again, uh, is reading through uh, the book of Colossians. It'll be kind of an introduction this week, so you have some time to get into that. There are resources available on the website. Uh, Confirmands, a reminder that uh, you're uh, starting uh, your meeting with your uh, mentors uh, during this season on Wednesday. So uh, I invite you to make sure that you've gotten in touch with them there. A couple of other things coming up. There will be an Easter band again this year. So if you have uh, any uh, instrumental inclinations of any age, um, sign up for that. Terry Ard will be coordinating. There's a sign-up sheet out on the Welcome Center. He'll also be reaching out to folks that uh, have uh, done that before. Also, if you'd like to help us decorate for Easter, believe it or not, it's time to start thinking about signing up for that. There's a sign-up as well. That will be a mix of tulips and um, uh, uh, lilies and some other things. If you had all lilies up here, your pastor would be <coughs> not able to function. Uh, but uh, we do a nice mix of things, so if you can help with that, uh, please sign up. Uh, finally, uh, this may have uh, uh, come to you in the prayers. Uh, Ida Mae Harford, uh, who has been with us uh, for the last little time, died on Friday, uh, and her service will be here on Wednesday morning. Uh, there'll be a visitation starting at 10, service at 11. Um, uh, Kathy uh, Day and I will be meeting with the family to kind of talk a little bit about that. They've talked maybe just kind of some light refreshments, more like fellowship kinds of things during the visitation time. Uh, if you either might have some time to help with that or would be able to maybe available to help provide uh, some items for that, um, let me know in some way. I don't have a sign-up sheet out. Uh, Kathy Day and I will be uh, talking with family this afternoon, and that way we've got some resources if we need them. Uh, but certainly keep uh, Ida May and her family in your prayers during this time. I invite you to receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. And we sing. Mm -hmm. 